Hope for the Fallen. A just man falleth seven times, riseth up again, but the wicked fall into mischief. Those who are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, we do not fall away. We fall. Yes, we do. Hi. <laughs> but we do not fall away. Because we who are saved, we have the Lord within us. And if we get to, to a point where our sin is so bad in our lives and that we are such an offense unto our Lord and to um, who he is, he will take us out of the way. Okay? But um, hope for the fallen. Hope for the fallen. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. Yes, yes. I'm using two today. We're going to be in the book of Jeremiah. And we have to remember that all scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Instruction and in righteousness. How to righteousness. Isaiah here, chapter 45, verse 19. I have not spoken in secret in the dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. So instruction and in righteousness how to and what the Lord deems right for us, okay? Okay? And you got to remember, being uh, righteousness is not merely about being correct. It is what the Lord deems right, not we ourselves, okay? You got to remember that. But all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And you also got to remember, for, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through, uh, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. I might have botched that one a little bit, but that was Romans 15.4. We're going to be looking at this today in Jeremiah. We're going to be concentrating in Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 9. You want, a, you want a good depiction of what's going on today for our instruction in righteousness? Read the book of Jeremiah, which is my personal favorite book out of all of Scripture. It's Jeremiah. Because it's so... Even though this happened thousands of years ago in the book of Jeremiah... It, you're, you're seeing virtually the same going on before our eyes today. In whatever nation you are under heaven, it doesn't matter. Okay? It does not matter. But this video is for our instruction in righteousness. And for you, of the church of the living God, who might have reached a point in your life, or in your walk with our Lord, where you've messed up so bad and you think that there's no going back. Our Lord can and will forgive anything. The unpardonable sin is only for when the Lord himself is on the earth. Okay, that will be in the description box. Uh, one moment, please. Let me write that down so I don't uh, forget. There we go. The unpardonable sin does not apply for us today because Jesus Christ himself you know, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is not on the earth today. We, his body are, but he himself in the flesh is not. So that's when that applies. But like I said, we're going to be looking into Jeremiah chapter 4. We're going to be concentrating on verses 1 on to verse 9 particularly. Okay? So please, get your authorized version of the scriptures known as, commonly referred to as, the King's, King James Version. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures and follow me along, word for word, verse by verse at the scriptures that we are going to be looking at today. Follow me along. Keep me accountable. Check me out. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Make sure I'm not skipping a groove. Check me out. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Be a Berean. Be a Berean. 
Search the scriptures, whether these things be so. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Please, please follow me along. Please, okay? Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 on to verse 9. It begins. Now, we got to remember, Jeremiah was written uh, under the, in the dispensation under the law. The law, which was faith and works, okay? Eternal security was not there in, under the law, okay? Because the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that spirit, was not a permanent resident in anyone under the law because the Holy Ghost, the Lord, could come and go, come and go as he saw fit or as someone messed up, okay? So eternal security was not there under the law. You have to remember that, okay? Totally dispens different dispensation. But like I said, we are looking at this for our instruction in righteousness, which is so needful for today, and especially right now at this season. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. If thou wilt return, O Israel. Israel is the apple of God's eye. Who is Israel? The Jewish people. Who are the Jewish people? The Hebraic people taken out of Shem. We have talked about that until we are blue in the face. Okay. The Jewish people as described in scripture are the Hebraic people. And the Hebrews are taken out of Shem. Not of Japheth or Ham. Okay. But if thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. Now you got to remember, faith and works was under this dispensation. Okay, faith and works. All right. But if thou wilt return, O Israel. For this, go to Jeremiah chapter 3. Very, something very interesting. Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 12 on to verse 15. Go. And proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel. Now, backsliding is only found in the Old Testament. The term backsliding is only found in the Old Testament. The principle of what is backsliding. People think backsliding is someone um, uh, falling away from the Lord and then getting saved again or some nonsense like that. No, uh, backsliding is um, going away from the Lord. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But the term itself, backsliding, only appears in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament, okay? That doesn't mean that we don't backslide today, but the term itself only appears in the Old Testament, okay? In regards to Israel... Okay? All right? Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel. Sliding back. You take the, the word as it sits. Back sliding. Backing away. Sliding away. Okay? I am, uh, yeah. Re, uh, go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord. And I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, saith the Lord. And I will not keep anger forever. And yes, amen, like I tell you all the time. Our Lord, our Father, Jesus Christ, our God, delights in mercy. He would much rather be merciful than be wrathful and take vengeance. But see, because he is just and perfect, he has to have wrath against the wicked. He has to be angry at the wicked every day. He has to be just because he is God. He is perfect. There is no flaw in him. Okay? You cannot have God's mercy without God's judgment. Okay? That's how it works. All right? People want to subtract the one from the other. Okay? It doesn't work that way. Okay? Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Well, I, I'm, I'm not in sin. I haven't done anything wrong. Mm. Have you read the proverb for today? The 28th proverb? Hmm? Did, you, did you read? Did you read the proverb for today at least? Huh? 
Uh, Proverbs 28, one verse, one verse, Proverbs 28. Oh, where is that? Uh, verse 13, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Okay? All right? This is a little different for us today in this dispensation because if you come to the Lord on his terms, you're once saved, always saved, sealed until the day of redemption. But what doesn't change is, while today you will not lose your salvation, but you can sure lose a whole lot of things. Like it says in, what is it, 2 Timothy chapter 2, I believe it is, where he says, if we deny him, he will deny us. Now that's not talking about salvation, that's talking about Blessings, mercy, protection, that kind of stuff, okay? So today, we don't lose our salvation, but we can lose a whole lot of other stuff, can't we? Yeah. Only acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice. Strangers, people who are not of Israel. For us today, for our instruction in righteousness, going on to the heathen, learning the ways of the heathen, trying to apply the ways of the heathen onto us of the church of the living God in our practice. Yeah. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. Hmm, interesting. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart. God has a heart. Yeah. God has a spirit and also a body. Yeah. He has a God has a spirit, God has a soul, and God has a body. Yeah. Because we're made in the image of God, okay? <laughs> And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And this is, a, this is a contrast to where if people want to believe in lies, like it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 on to verse 12, that the Lord will be happy. It's like, okay, you don't want to, you don't want, you don't receive the love of the truth. Therefore, here, you want to believe in a lie? Here, go ahead. Believe in a lie. Gobble it up all day. Go right ahead. Yeah. Okay, but see this this notion of okay, you've got messed up. You return unto the Lord, and He will get light, He will He always guides you into the right path. Our Lord never guides you onto sin. But see, if you reject what He says and do contrary to what He says, He will give you over onto that. See, if we deny Him, He will deny us. Okay, all right. If he says, don't do that, and you keep persisting, he's like, fine, do it, do it. And then you come back to me with your tail between your legs. Okay? All right? But looking at verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. Married. He was married unto the children of Israel. What does this mean? Now, right away you think about the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we're going to touch on. Okay, that I personally believe the marriage so uh, the marriage of the Lamb happens on earth. I believe that. Um, we will find out, won't we? There are some that believe that the marriage happen, the marriage supper of the Lamb happens in heaven. Um, I am one that believes it happens on the earth, but that's that's a totally different thing. Go to Deuteronomy chapter seven. Deuteronomy chapter seven. Okay, this thing about married how he was married unto the children of Israel. God chose the children of Israel in that in a different dispensation as the apple of his eye, okay? We are chosen because the Lord chose the way of the cross. And we go the way of the cross, we are part of his chosen because he chose the way of the cross, get it? And we as Gentiles are grafted in to the tree of the Jew, okay? That's, uh, that's Romans 11, okay? 
That's Romans 11. We've got video on that and whatnot about replacement theology, what the Catholics do, that we are grafted into the tree of the Jew, okay? We are in the tree of the Jew by adoption. And the marriage of the Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb happens a lot later, okay? But this thing about the marriage, how he was married unto the children of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 on verse 8. Now, notice, notice this. Our Lord says, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Them who? The Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Seven nations greater and mightier than thou. They weren't to make marriages with those of other kindreds. Why? Well, because salvation is of the Jews. God the Father, Jesus Christ, is come in the flesh, was going to be coming out of Israel. Okay? So the Lord wanted the gene pool as pure as possible for that for that reason. Okay? And there is also another reason because the they, the children of Israel, were God's representatives at that time uh, in that dispensation. The Jew is the apple of God's eye, okay? The Jew, the Hebraic people, taken from Shem, not Ham or Japheth, are God's chosen people. We today in this dispensation are grafted in, okay? We talk about that in the Romans 11 video about replacement theology, what the Catholics do. That will be in the description box if you have any questions, okay? But, okay, neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. Why? For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. You know how it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, you know, uh, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Okay, because what fellowship hath light with darkness? What fellowship hath Christ with darkness? Belial or Belial, however you want to pronounce it, okay? All right, all right. For us today, our instruction in righteousness, you intermingle with heathenism and with heathens, pagans, non-believers, people who are not of the church of the living God, you hang around with them long enough, their, her their heresy, their error, their evil could cleave to you like dung on the bottom of your shoe and it could turn you away. Yes, it could. Okay? For they will, verse 4, For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. That hasn't changed today. That hasn't changed today. You're of the church of the living God and you're going after idols. Uh, well, the, you might not be dropped dead suddenly, but it's possible if it gets bad enough. Okay? God is a God of judgment. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's dealing with man differently today in this dispensation than he did under the law, absolutely. But God doesn't change. The way he deals with man, that changes, okay? But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves, trees, and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. And we will be talking about what it means to be holy in probably the next video. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee. Different dispensation. Okay? Chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all the people. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Calvinists will come in here and try to weave in elect and non-elect. Okay. God is a God who chooses. Okay. God is a God who chooses. Okay. He chose the law. He chose Israel. Okay. He chose Abraham. Abram. Okay. And from Abram, Abraham, he chose out of you know, Shem, okay, he took Abram out of Shem. Uh, Abram was of Shem. And taking Abram out of Shem, he established the Hebraic line. And in establishing the Hebraic line, he chose the law. And today, he chose the cross, okay? 
God is a God who chooses, okay? The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. God is a God of the, of the little guy. You got these Catholics who say, well, and some of these King James Bible believing Christians who say, well, if God had a church, it would be the biggest one. <laughs> no, he wouldn't. God's a God of the little guy. Okay, uh, you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 on to verse 31, I believe it is, about, you know, how you see your calling, not many mighty, not many wise, not many noble, I just Brad Isaac, excuse me, but that is why God is a God of the little guy. God wants people to cling to him for every necessity, but see, people who are mighty, people who are wise, who are noble, they can fall into that trap of self-sufficiency, Okay as Israel did, because of his blessings, as have some of you, as the church of the living God, because of his blessings. Where you value the blessings rather over the blessor. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And of course, he did this because of the promise unto the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? That's where he says, love to you. Okay? Because he loved the fathers. Okay? And that transcends. All right? But see, he chose Israel. He was married unto Israel. Okay? And we, as adopted, grafted in, we have... Uh, inheritance in that marriage that is unto Israel. That doesn't make mean we are Jews. We're going to address that today as well, okay? We're going to address that as, as today as well as we have before, but okay? We are grafted in because the Lord chose Israel. He's married unto them. Now go to Ezekiel, of course. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. Okay, when it comes to this topic, you cannot avoid Ezekiel chapter 16. And don't worry, we're not, we don't have the time to read the whole thing. We're going to be reading verses 6 under verse 14 in Ezekiel chapter 16. And when I passed by thee, talking about Israel, who he chose, okay, who was the least of all, okay, and when I passed by thee, I saw thee polluted in thine own blood. I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxen great, and thou art become ex and and thou art come to excellent ornaments. <laughs> no pun intended there. Thy breasts are fashioned. And thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. So you were once, as a lost person, ugly, dead in trespasses and sins. But see, where it says, I covered thee. Okay, he covered thee. How are, you, how are we covered today? In his blood. Okay? Hence, the Lord sees in us the righteousness of Christ. That we might be made the righteous, uh, be made the righteousness in Him. I'm gonna hold your place there instead of butchering that. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse uh, twenty-one. Let's get that right, Brad. Instead of butchering it, okay. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Okay. Okay, now go back to Ezekiel chapter 16. Okay? Verse 8. Now when I passed by thee, I looked upon thee. Behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. There's the cover. Covered thy nakedness. Spread thy skirt. Uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Ruth asked uh, Boaz to do the same. Take me as your wife. Okay? For us today, he spread his skirt over thee. 
okay? We are grafted in to that tree of Israel, the Jew, okay? The Hebraic people, we're grafted in, okay? And covered thy nakedness. Thy nakedness is that uh, saved by the blood of the crucified one, okay? We are washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, okay? Yea, I swear unto thee, today we are once saved, always saved, in this dispensation, okay? Remember, we're looking at this for instruction in righteousness. And entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine, married unto thee. Okay? We belong unto the Lord. Okay? The marriage supper, we're going to look at this, doesn't happen until months later. Okay? But let's continue. Then washed I thee with water, yea, and, th and I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shot thee with badger's skin. skin. I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck. Notice how he's describing the beauty of a woman. Okay, And remember, the fear of the Lord is comparable in Scripture unto the most beautiful, gorgeous woman you could ever imagine. Okay, And for you, sisters, that doesn't mean that you be a sodomite. Okay, The Lord is just saying that the fear of the Lord is beyond compare even to a beautiful woman. Okay? All right? And I put a jewel on, okay, I deck thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and embroidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wax wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty. Like it says in Deuteronomy, this shall be thy wisdom when nations will say, what, what, what nation, what people are like this that has God so close to them and has all these righteous judgments, which, they, uh, which the lost world ought to today be saying of us, the church of the living God, okay? But when you got these Christians promoting paganism coming along and uh, flesh, yeah, yeah. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, the Lord's comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. But, but, verse 15, but thou didst trust in thine own beauty, didn't you? Oh, and hence the plight and problem of us that could be of the church of the living God, that we will fall into this trap ourselves. Don't we? Yeah. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty. All things are lawful for you. And playedest the harlot because of thy renown. And went on to the heathen. Yeah. And poured out thy fornication. On everyone that passed by, his it was. Now, go to Matthew chapter 25. Okay, Matthew chapter 25. We have to address this. Matthew chapter 25. Okay, verses 10 on to verse 13. Where our Lord makes mention of the marriage supper. And it's in the parable of the virgins, okay? The uh, ten virgins, okay? 
Uh, and this has not <laughs> and this has nothing to do with what the charismatics want you to believe about the the oil, the anointing oil of the Holy Ghost and blah blah blah. No, this has everything to do with the marriage supper of the Lamb, and this has nothing to do with us for to today, doctrinally. Okay? Okay, but uh, Matthew chapter twenty five, verses ten on verse thirteen. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. This is a reference unto the marriage of the Lamb. Okay? Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore. For ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Okay? Okay? So he's using that as the example. This is a reference onto the marriage supper of the Lamb, which you go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, we have to address this. Okay? Because it says, For I am married unto you. Okay? God chose the children of Israel. The Jew is the apple of God's eye. The Jew is a Hebrew taken out of Shem, not of Japheth or not of Ham. Okay? The Jew is the apple of God's eye. Salvation is of the Jew. Okay? All right? We as Gentiles are grafted in to that tree of the Jew. Okay? All right? But Revelation chapter 19 Revelation chapter 19, okay? Revelation chapter 19, all right? <clears throat> and notice too, this is after Revelation chapter 18, after, after Rome gets destroyed. But you know what else it is not? You know what this is before? This is before the great white throne of judgment. You gotta remember the book of Revelation is in chronological in chronological order. Okay, Revelation chapter nineteen, verse six on to verse nine. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters. And you read in Revelation chapter seventeen, many waters is likened unto people. Okay. And as the voice of a might, of mighty thundering, saying, "Alleluia," not "Hallelujah," "Alleluia." For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. The marriage of the Lamb is come. Okay? This is why I believe it's going to be on earth, not in heaven. Okay? And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Mm. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Okay? So the marriage supper of the Lamb happens during the time of Jacob's trouble, but also happens before the great white throne of judgment. So we see here when, uh, what was that? Uh, when Satan is cast into the, uh, where was that? Uh, uh, Satan is cast in, uh, into the bottomless pit in uh, Revelation chapter 20. Okay. So the marriage supper of the lamb happens before Satan is bound for a thousand years. Okay. And before the great white throne of judgment. Okay? So the marriage supper of the Lamb happens during the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Towards the end of it, when he comes back. Okay? We had to we had to look through this because in Jeremiah chapter 4, if thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord. Israel, the apple of God's eye, for us today, for our instruction and in righteousness, those who went the chosen way of the cross, hence we are chosen because we go God's chosen way. We don't boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way, a way that we want to go, but we go the way that the Lord has prescribed, hence we are chosen. Okay? That's how that works. 
Don't let these guys be a lie to you that you're chosen because of the color of your skin. Okay? Those guys are dangerous devils. Watch out for that, okay? Or that you happen to be from Germany. And to you, my brethren of Germany, sorry for making that reference. More on that much later. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, thy, then shalt thou not remove. Thessalonians chapter 1. Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians, excuse me. First Thessalonians chapter 1. We want verses 4 on to verse 10. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, like we have just said, the election of God. God chose. God elected the cross. Today in this dispensation, you go to the Lord on his terms, which is the only way to be saved, broken of your self-righteousness, godly sorrow, manning up and taking responsibility for you putting him on the cross, just like I did, okay, and, and, and having fear of him because he's going to uh, send you to hell unless he saved you. You call on his name and he saved you. You are part of the elect because you went the way God chose. So many people want to mess that up, okay? Okay, it's not Calvinism. Okay, it's not due to the color of your skin or kindred. Okay, get that through that thick head of yours. Okay, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and the Lord is that spirit. And in much assurance, because we're once saved, always saved, because it's the Lord that seals you until the day of redemption. Okay. As ye know, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So that ye were in samples, I love that word, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. In samples, okay? Ambassadors of Christ. Okay, having the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. Okay, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, by, by speaking the things of scripture, but also by their living at adhering to scripture, walking their talk. Okay. But also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything like we already touched on. You know, the lost world ought to see in us the church of the living God. It's like, wow, these guys are different. Wow. These guys are different. But but why are, why are, they, why are they putting up trees and, and, and making such a fuss and causing a division amongst, other, amongst themselves over this stupid stuff? <laughs> more on that later uh, not in this video but in one coming okay but but we as the church of the living god are to demonstrate in adhering to the scriptures okay for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to god from idols to serve the living and true God. If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. It is not okay for you as the church of the living God to allow in your life or in your walk, God forbid, paganism. Someone once said, you cannot take that which is pagan and make it Christian. But today, Christian is pagan. So go figure. You cannot take that which is pagan and turn it into worship and to whatever onto the church of the living God. Okay. And the thing about idols. Now, talking about an idol, you know, an idol is, a, is like a, a Buddha statue. Or a Shimu statue, or a Diana of the Ephesians statue, or a, a marionette statue. Okay, yes, but is that all that an idol is? 
See, in order to justify paganism, some will tell you, yeah, that's all idolatry is. No, idolatry is you setting up whatever it is in your heart above what God has said. Well, I'm not doing that. I'm not worshiping it. Uh, worshiping, maybe not in what, what scripture calls worship, but if you put anything in your heart that isn't of the Lord, that is pagan, and setting that up in your heart and causing division and uh, wrecking your own life in the process? Brother, sister, that's idolatry. What's the idol? You. You. You're the idol. <laughs> You're the idol. You're the idol. Sorry, my knees down so I can forget. You're the idol. Verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Delivered us. For we are not appointed unto wrath, but to salvation, as it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Where is that? Verse 10. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Once saved, always saved. We, the church of the living God, the body of Christ, do not go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Watch out for people who say, well, once saved, always saved, never sat right in my spirit. Because you have the spirit of a devil, Mark. Okay? That's why. All right? But, now, let's go to Acts chapter 19, this thing about idols. Now, you got to remember... In context here, the idols that are being spoken of, yes, are little marionette statues. But is that all that an idol is? Some, in order to justify paganism, will tell you, yes, that's all idolatry is. So when they're looking all smug and arrogant in uh, photos of themselves with that look of arrogance and pride on them, um, tell me, is that not idolatry? And hey, some, you know, that's why I've quit putting, uh, letting you see my face when uh, the thumbnail thing, because, you know, some have called me. It's like, you know, Brad, and some of your thumbnails, you, you it's like, you're right. You're right. And I'm not going to take the time and go through over 500 videos and put thumbnails on all of them. But that's something that the Lord corrected me through a sister and a brother about that. Okay. A proud look. What's the idol? You. You yourself. And, that, and that's what it gets down to. Okay? Yes, an idol is a little marionette statue. Okay? I know this is about water. But we've got to remember, that's not all an idol is relegated to. Be careful for the, with those who want to justify paganism, paganism sin by telling you that that's what an idol is. It's, that's all it is. That's dangerous, okay? Acts chapter 19, verses 18 on to verse 20, okay? And many that believed came and confessed and shewed their deeds. You're the church of the living God and you're involved in idolatry, sin. Lord, I, I've, I've messed up. I've gotten away from you. I've, I've done things I shouldn't. I repent. I put this stuff away. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Okay. Hope for the, hope for the fallen. Okay. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them all and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. That's a lot of money. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. <laughs> Getting rid of the evil in your lives is costly, but it is well worth it in the light of eternity, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And of course, Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, a little bit more on this, about this uh, idolatry stuff. Acts chapter 17, verses 16 and 17, okay, about idolatry. You know, idolatry is rampant right now in the body of Christ, especially at this time of season for some. 
not necessarily the worshiping of statues, but the worshiping of a tree, the worshiping of your own desires, the worship of yourself. And what do they say? I'm not worshiping myself. Yeah, then why are you doing what you want to do and justifying it? All things are lawful for you. I understand that. Good luck. But Acts chapter 17, verses 16 and 17. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. When it comes, especially to this time of year, my spirit gets stirred. And on an individual uh, basis, I will talk with these people about this. You know, when I'm asked about things about this coming wicked season, I always send a link for one video, and it's like, hey, that's what I have to say about it. And that video stands, by the way, still. Don't worry, we're going to address this more in depth in another video, okay? But idolatry. Idolatry. And see, Satan has come in and sown seeds amongst brethren that the idolatry is not obvious of a marionette statue, but idolatry in worshiping of what I want to do, the way I want to do it, when I want to do it. I, 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 me, me, me. That's modern idolatry for you. That's modern idolatry for you. Okay? All right, now, and looking at verses 32 and 34 in Acts chapter 17. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed, among the which was Dionysus the Aeropagite, and a woman named Damaris, and other with, others with them. So, we as the Church of the Living God, when we see paganism, idolatry, we are number one to speak out against it. And when our words will not be heard by how we adhere and uh, revolve our lives around the scriptures, so if they will not hear our words, they will behold it in the way we behave ourselves as the Church of the Living God. Okay? And like this said here, some will hear, and when they hear, they'll be like, yeah. Yeah, right. Others will be like, I need to hear a little bit more. Well, others get, you know, they get pricked to the heart. They're like, oh boy. Really? Oh, okay. What, what must I do now? Okay. Okay. Now, and also we got to go to Romans chapter one. Romans chapter 1, verses 20 on to verse 25. Um, if thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me, and if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. Taking something that is pagan and trying to make it applicable and justify it for the church of the living God is not okay. It's not. Is it going to affect your salvation? No. But you are making our Lord look bad and you are causing strife and division. Okay? And plus, those blessings that you are getting because you are defending uh, paganism, who's answering those prayers anyway? Who's the one who's giving you that? Hmm? The Lord or the little G God of this world? Which one? I wonder. Hmm. But Romans chapter 20, uh, 20, Romans chapter 1, verses 20 on to verse 25. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We are made in the image of God. We have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. But that means that God himself has a spirit he has a soul. He has a body. That's what that means, okay? We are not the Godhead, God forbid. But no, we are made in the image of God, okay? A lot of people say that, well, we've lost that image of God or blah, blah, blah. No, no. The image of God is that we are made in his image, that we have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. That's what that means, okay? You want proof of God's existence? Look at if you can handle it, <laughs> you know, if you can handle it, look at yourself in the mirror. 
Okay? You have a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. Okay? All right? And hey, that ought to be easy for some of you who's, who yourself is your little idol. Okay? Because that when they knew God, just here, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Here, why would God save a wretch like me? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all, all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, okay? But became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. And the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And to behave foolishly is to behave as if you say in your heart, there is no God. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professing themselves to have the fear of the Lord, they became fools. Why? Because look at what some of them justify. <laughs> and they say, well, I want to do what I want to do, and I'm going to do what I want to do the way I want to do it as much as I want to do it. And I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Yeah. And change. The glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and to birds, you know, the little bird that poops droppings on you of that satanic trinity and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Now, these are talking about statues, right? Well, an image made like to corruptible man, you know, the tale of Narcissus, who when he saw his reflection in the water, he fell in love with his own reflection. And then what happens? He dives head, he falls head first and drowns. Right? Yes, this, yes, talking about making statutes, but also there are cultures out there that worship the Brahma bull and also creeping things that worship snakes. And there are, there are a whole bunch of people out there that worship men. You're going to see it in this coming month. Okay? And what happens? Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshiped and served the creature, Satan is created being, more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. But also, too, the creature, they uh, worship themselves. They worship their own wisdom, their own knowledge, their own accomplishments. They, they heard that, you know, they got that uh, a tennis elbow by patting themselves on the back. See? Okay? And James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Remember, this, this is for our instruction in righteousness. We haven't even gotten past the first verse yet, have we? No, we haven't. But James chapter 1, verses 5 and 8, on to verse 8. If any of you lack wisdom, the fear of the Lord, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given, a given, and it shall be given him. Lord, teach me how to fear your name. Teach me how to fear you so I know how to do right and to know you. Please. Okay, he's not. And it's like, give me knowledge, Lord, of your word, of yourself. How to, help me to learn of you. And how do you learn of the Lord through the scriptures? Okay? But let him ask in faith. You got to believe that the Lord is. That he is God, the Father. Okay? You got to believe that he is. That you're nothing. But see, so many people cling to this little, well, I'm not that bad. And then they go to the Lord. See, that's, let's read. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, there are many ways that we can apply double-minded, but one of them is simply double-minded. Do you still have a mind for your own things? For not all, for, uh, all men seek their own, 
not the things that be of Christ, okay? Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who for everything set his sights on the cross, which is death, okay? Death to self, all right? All right? So see, the Lord's telling the, the Israelites, the Jews, in Jeremiah, Return on to me. But, you know, you got to put these things away. And today, it does not affect our salvation. But if you're going to cling to these things, like having to cleave to the bottom of your shoe like dog dung, and expect to be right with the Lord, it's not going to accept. It's not going to affect your salvation if you are saved, born again, converted of the church and living God. No, it's not. But you're, you're dragging our Lord's name through the mud. And you're making the church of the living God look bad. You really are. Verse 2 in Jeremiah chapter 4. And thou shalt swear, uh, verses 2 on to verse 3. And thou shalt swear, the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. Eventually that will happen when Jewry accepts their Savior. Okay? For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your foul ground, and sow not among thorns. What do you think of? By the way, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Just one verse. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Matthew chapter 13. Thorns. Probably some of you was like, I know. Yes, you're right. Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. The parable of the seed and the sower. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. The word will accomplish what the Lord will have it to accomplish, either to, uh, what is it, to excuse or ex accuse you, okay? The Lord's word is going to have its effect no matter what, okay? But you got to remember, it's not something that's being done at gunpoint, okay? But see, the cares of this world, the thorns, and the deceitfulness of riches, Choke the word. Thorns. Yes. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Church of the living God, brethren and sisters. Okay? Break up your foul ground and sow not among thorns. Are you of the church of the living God and sowing among thorns things of this world? Hmm? Are you? Are you, are you taking what is pagan and trying to justify it for yourself because it's what you want to do? Because it makes you feel good? Because the memories are good? And that, and that goes beyond this ridiculous devilish season that's coming up. That goes beyond that. Are you your own little idol? Are you your own little idol? Am I my own little idol? We need to, we need to, we need to wrestle with these things, brethren to wrestle with these things, okay? But yes, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, he hears it, okay? And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. Because that gets in the way. Because this gets in the way. And of course, 1 John chapter 2, of course, this is like a no-brainer there. Uh, for this, First John chapter 2, verses 15 on to verse 17. Love not the world. I don't love the world. Then why are you neck deep in it, buddy? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust, first thing mentioned, the lust of the flesh, 
Because that's what lost people lust after. They lust after flesh. The, these people, these, these people who are uh, justifying paganism, it's all about flesh. And, and look what else. And the lust of the eyes. Oh, look at the pretty lights. And the pride of life. All things are lawful for me. It's not of the Father, but is of the world, which is earthly, sensual, devilish. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart. Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. And this is a true saying. At the end of the day, it is, a, it is an issue of the heart. But someone who says, God knows my heart, is justifying their sin. It's the same as someone that don't judge me to justify them their, their sin. They have no wisdom in them. Oh, they might have a lot of knowledge, but they have no wisdom. The wisdom, the wisdom that they do have is the wisdom of the world, not the wisdom which is the fear of the Lord. Okay? You gotta watch out for people. God knows my heart justifying themselves, justifying their sinful actions. Don't judge me! Justifying sin or a heretic. Okay? Watch out for this stuff. Especially what's coming down the pipe now, okay? All right? But it is an issue of the heart. The reason why you are doing is as important, if not more so, than the doing, okay? You want to do it. I want to do it. Oh, the Lord, I guess I have to. You're missing it. You're missing it. Okay? Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. And I forgot some of my notes here. Uh, Romans chapter 2, verses 25 on to verse 29. Now, you gotta rightly divide the word of truth. This is for us today in this dispensation, which is by grace through faith. You do not keep the law today to be saved. Okay? Watch out for devils who say that you have to. Okay? For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, Thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. What is this talking about? Galatians chapter 5. Any time you dear brethren, especially you dear Hamite brethren, you run into one of these devils who say that you got to keep the commandments, you go to Galatians, uh, the book of Galatians to refute them. Okay? But Galatians chapter 5 verse 3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Now we in America, us males, generally are circumcised without our knowledge. Okay? Okay. But if someone willingly is like, well, I'm going to get circumcised because that's what the law says today in this dispensation. Okay? Uh, no. No, no, no. You're a debtor to keep the whole law. And salvifically, we don't keep the law today. Okay? And, and, and like where he says here in verse 25 in Romans chapter 2, um, For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. Uh, Galatians 5 verse uh, 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. But if thou be, in uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 25, But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. What does that mean? James Chapter 2, verse 10. James chapter 2, verse 10. This is what this means. Okay? And this is and this is the thing that these guys who want to preach to you about keeping the law today avoid. 
Okay, James chapter 2, verse 10. <laughs> For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So if you if you do not steal, but you covet, you've broken the law. And these guys today who say you, you gotta keep the commandments, you know, you gotta keep the Ten Commandments, they seem to want to avoid that. Part of like, well, if you break one, you've broken them all. See, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us on to Christ. The law was there to show us how incapable we are in ourselves of doing what God has said. That's what that's there for. Okay? But now let's keep reading. Okay? Therefore, if the uncircumcision, those who, you know, uh, Gentiles he's referring to, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Well, see, we got to keep the law. No. What he is saying is... Okay, the law was given on to the Jew, okay, the Hebraic people in a different dispensation. But what he's saying is when people who were not under the law, who were not of Israel, were doing that what, what was of the law, trying to walk godly, that's what he's saying. He's not saying that we are to keep the law today or else that would contradict what he said in Galatians, fool. Come on now, let's continue. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, okay, if it fulfill the law, judge thee. And shall not, okay, wait, let's read verse 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision. Verse 27. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee. Who by the letter and circumcision thus transgress the law. Letter is referring on to the commandments, okay? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Under the law, you could say, well, I did this. Uh, look at the, uh, the Pharisee and the publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all. Okay? Remember that. Remember that. Okay? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, because under the law it was an outward thing. Okay? But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and that circumcision is, of the, is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, not in the law, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Uh, so many people want to confuse this. And also, we go to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 under verse 10. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 under verse 10. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 8 on to verse 10. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle, the law, was yet standing which was a figure for the time then present, rightly dividing the word of truth, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, because you had to continually offer for sin. But see, Christ Jesus died, buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and he shed his blood on the cross. It is finished. The law has been fulfilled in that manner that the blood that Christ shed on the cross cleanses us from all sin. You trying to keep the law today, you're saying that it's not finished. Beware, brother, sister. Beware. Like Paul says in Galatians, what? You started in the spirit? Are you now made perfect by your flesh? Beware, brother, sister. Beware, okay? <clears throat> Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal, carne, fleshly ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. And that's not the Protestant Reformation. Reformation. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blood he shed on the cross. The law being changed. Why? Because... Because, well, God doesn't change. You're right. But what changed? He paid the price for our sin. So animal sacrifice for sin is not necessary. 
You've, I've asked Jews, why aren't you sacrificing animals today? That's so passe. We don't need to do that today. I've heard that from Jews. But also, then again, it's like when, during the time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to be reinstituted. There are some Jews out there, some of the Hasidim, that would offer animal sacrifice today. But there are some, like some of the Reformed of Judaism. Of Judaism. It's like, that's what they did in old time. We're, we're, we've evolved. I've actually heard that. But some of the Hasidim narrow it down. It's like, well, if we were to be doing animal sacrifices today, especially here in America, uh, we would be in trouble with the law. But during the time of Jacob's trouble, that's going to be reinstituted. Okay? Go to Colossians chapter 2 now. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Not Philippians, Brad. Colossians chapter 2. And this we're going to touch a little bit more on in another video coming in the near future. Um... Where is it? Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts, of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and verse 12. <laughs> Beware! Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. It's okay to do what is uh, heathen because God's grace covers it all. All things are lawful for me. Yeah, all things are lawful for you. That is right. That cannot be disputed. But not all things are expedient. Unless you have something to sell, right? <laughs> Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy or vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world are not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? And ye are complete in him. He is our all. Jesus is our all. Okay? which is the head of all principality and power. There's the word all. Like I said in the video on Friday, you want a very interesting, rewarding study for yourself? Study the word all. Okay? In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Yeah. In putting off the body of the sin or the body of sins of the flesh in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism identified in his death okay death of the cross okay wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead okay Identified with him in his death. You know, water baptism, which is not necessary for salvation, is an outward profession of an inner conversion. The, symbol, the symbolism is you die, you go under the water, you are dead under the water, and then you are raised up alive in Christ. It's symbolic, okay? It's symbolic. It's not salvific. Watch out for Catholics and Charismatics who, uh, uh, and some, and even Lutherans and others say you got to be baptizing water. No, you don't. No, you don't. Okay. But see, philosophy. This time of the year, men become philosophers, especially with Scripture trying to justify paganism. Okay. Okay. But uh, now go to John chapter four. John chapter four. Okay, John chapter 4, verses, what do we want? Verses 22 and on to verse 24. John chapter 4, 22 on to verse 24. Our Lord speaking unto a Gentile woman. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. The Hebraic people chosen out of Shem, not of Ham or of Japheth, okay? But of Shem, okay? That's how there are Shemites who are not of Israel, like the Asiatics, okay? 
like the Japanese, the Chinese, and the the Koreans and stuff like that, uh, those in Thailand and stuff like that. Okay, they are of Shem, but they're not Hebrews. Okay, but the hour cometh, and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. Not just in an outward adornment. Not in, well, I keep the commandments. I was baptized in water. Okay, I give tithes. I am not like this other guy. No, but in spirit and in truth. Okay. You can change the way you look. But are you a new creature in Christ Jesus? Huh? God is a, a spirit. The Bibles take out the A and it says God is spirit in the Bibles. Then how are you to know which is which? Because you, you take out the A that creates confusion. God is a spirit, meaning that through the scriptures you can uh, distinguish which one is which. You take that A out, you got to go to a Jesuit trained cemetery and pastor to tell you. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the truth for us today is what? By grace through faith. Not that we don't have law to follow, which Paul gives us in uh, Romans chapter 13, okay? Which is... Absent of keeping the Sabbath, by the way. Okay, you notice that. Okay, but and there's some uh, smart Alexes out there who say, "Well, it doesn't say anything about worshiping idols." <laughs> have you read First and Second Corinthians before? Uh, have you read Galatians before? Huh? Have you read the Pauline epistles before? Yeah, it doesn't say that specifically because it's one of those things that he doesn't need to. Because it's addressed throughout. Okay? But, uh, where are we? Go to Psalm chapter 7. So I did it again, brother. Psalm 7. Psalms don't have chapters. Ugh. Ugh. Forgive me. Okay? Psalm 7. Psalm 7. I slapped myself because uh, my brother and best friend... Uh, and even uh, my dear uh, brother from Croatia is like, Brad, sorry. <laughs> See, I make mistakes. Psalm 7, 9 on verse 16. Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reins. My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. God judgeth the righteous, whom he deems right. Those who come to him on his terms today for us in this dispensation. Okay? The way of the cross, which is death to self. Okay? God judgeth the righteous. And God is angry with the wicked every day. And one of the lies that Christianity tells you, God's not mad at you. Well, in a way they're right because God is not crazy. God is angry. God is angry at you. You reject the gospel. You reject his, you know, his gospel, what he says for salvation today. You're a child of wrath. God's wrath is for you. God's angry at you. Yes, God judgeth the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, that's repent, he will wet, wet, W-H-E-T, as a sharpening stone, wet his sword, he hath bent his bow and made it ready. What are we reading to? Verse 16. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. Hand you over like we already read in uh, Romans, okay? He will hand you over to that. All right? <clears throat> he ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity. He hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. He made a pit and digged it, and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come up down upon his own pate. 
A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked fall into mischief. Okay? All right? So today, church of the living God, if you're in sin, if you're in idolatry, okay, um, you're not going to lose your salvation, but you can lose the blessings of his provision, his compassion, his kindness, his fellowship. You can lose so many other things, but you won't lose your salvation. In this dispensation on the law, when Jeremiah was talking about, yeah, it was a salvific because eternal security was right was not there, okay? And this is a warning for our instruction in righteousness. If you're going to cleave to that paganism, that sin, whatever it is in your life, that could cost you. And, oh, you might be, be seeming to be prosperous because of it. Who's the one who's being allowed to prosper you? And uh, go to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 on to verse 5. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but uh, except ye believe, <laughs> repent, ye shall, also, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt? In Jerusalem, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. When he said this, the law was still binding. Again, today, we have the church of the living God. We don't lose salvation because it's not ours to lose. We're once saved, always saved. But we can lose so many other things. Okay, like I, he says here, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of, his, of Jerusalem, Okay? Those who belong unto the Lord. Okay? Lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Okay? And on that, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Okay? Romans chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 11. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. Hypocritical judgment is what is condemned in Scripture. Okay? If I were a drunkard telling you not to be a drunkard, that would be hypocritical judgment. That is what is being condemned. This, what Paul is talking about, is lost people condemning other lost people who are <laughs> for doing things that they're, they're both lost. Okay? They don't, the foundation that they have is sand. Okay, we who are of the church of the living God, who judge spiritual, who compare spiritual things with spiritual, we judge according to the scriptures. We judge ourselves, but we also judge others according to the scriptures. What he's talking about in Romans 2 verse 1 are lost people, the pot calling the cattle black. Okay, lost people judging others where they're not saved. That's what he's talking about. But we are sure the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Well, I'm a good person. I'm a, but you're not saved. But I, I, I do good things. I'm not like that guy. You're, you're both not saved. You see, that's what that's talking about. This is what he's talking about. And it proves it. Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Long suffering is for lost people, okay? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. See right there, verse 4 uh, shows you that he's addressing lost people, judging other lost people as if they're righteous and they're lost, okay? Verse 4 proves that, okay? But after thy hardness and impentient heart, not willing to kneel, Treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing 
seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, oh, you're going to see them in droves coming up, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. And unlike some people want you to believe, for there is no respect of persons with God. Today, there is no respect of persons. People say, you need to see the Lord yourself personally. I've seen it. You're saying that God is a respecter of persons. I'm black, therefore I'm chosen. You're saying God is a respecter of persons. I'm a white uh, Hebrew Israelite. I'm a Brizraelite. You're saying God is a respecter of persons. I'm elect and they're not elect. You're saying God is a respecter of persons today. Watch out for those people. Okay? Watch out for those. And of course, 2 Thessalonians, which made mention to, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 out of verse 12. And with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, like we already alluded to, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. You don't want the truth? You don't want absolute truth? Okay, you want to justify whatever it is you're doing? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. You may, you may be of the church and living God, but is the devil blessing you? Huh? Is the devil giving you these things? Is the Lord allowing you to be deceived? Hmm? Is the Lord allowing you to be deceived because you have chosen yourself over what the Lord has said? Brother, sister? Hmm? Hmm? And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Hmm. Now, let's read verses 5 on to verse 6 in Jeremiah chapter 4. Declare ye in Judah, warn the people. Speak the truth of Scripture. Speak absolute truth of the Scripture. Walk according to the Scripture. And publish in Jerusalem. Don't, shh, especially at these times. Unless the Lord doesn't want you to speak, you know. You go as the Lord uh, guides you, Okay. And say, blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together and say, assemble yourselves and let us go into the defense cities. Set up the standard towards Zion. The standard, the authorized version of scripture. Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north and a great destruction. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, talking about publishing, warning the people. You need to repent. You need to repent. Are you wrong with the Lord? Are you in idolatry? Are you in sin? Are you justifying your sin? Through? Are you trying to... You need to repent. You need to repent. Warn the people. You need to get right with God. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 11 on to verse 12. Okay? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Paul never talked about the fear of the Lord. I shut up. Right there. The terror of the Lord. You're going to have to give an account to him. Okay? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You're going to pay for what you're going to do. You're going to give an account. You're not going to get away from it. Okay? But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So see, warning the people through Scripture, but also adhering to Scripture and living their life today according to Scripture, walking their talk. Okay? Words are important. Words have meaning. But see, what good are your words going to be when you're walking like a devil? See, the Word of God is true. Yes, and the word of God convicts. Yes, yes. But most people, most of the lost people that you are going to encounter, you're talking about, you know, uh, repenting of your self-righteousness, and yet you're in idolatry, you're in sin, 
and they're visible. You're like them. You're like the world. And you're going to tell them? Hmm. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. See, I'm a Christian and I'm not judging you. I can, you can have a tattoo today. You can do, you can bring paganism in to whatever. It's okay. I'm not judging. It's not going to cost you your salvation. No, it's not. But you're bringing shame upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, and you're blaspheming His word almost. Okay? All right? If you're truly saved, genuinely saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, no, it's not going to cost you your salvation. No, but it's going to cost you so many other things. And while this thing about warning people about this, which we are to do as the church of the living God, admonish one another. Okay? Admonish one another. And you know, have a little grace with your own brothers, brothers and sisters. Not of your relations, but of the church of the living God, okay? You know, if you have a brother who's in sin and is struggling with it, and they know it, have a little grace. Have a little grace, okay? There are those I know and love who are dear to me who sin every day and they know it, but they don't justify it. They say, hey, I'm going to pay for this. I know. I'm not going to abandon a brother like that. I'm not. Or a sister. I'm not. It's like, you know what you're doing is wrong, and that's between you and the Lord. It's like, I know, and I'm not justifying it. Okay? That's a rare thing with people of the Church of the Living God. Is it a healthy and good thing? No. But it is the honest truth. And I respect that. I respect that. Acts chapter 17, verses 22 on to verse 31 now. Okay? Then Paul stood, uh, what was it, 21, uh, 22, yes. Hmm. Uh, you know, when Paul saw the city given over to uh, idolatry, his spirit was uh, stirred in him. We already saw that, okay? Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Whereas I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Note all in that, okay? Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Okay? Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Again, Note the all. You're alive today because the Lord has allowed it. Okay? And hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Yes! Yes! Now there's type A, type O, but yes, we have all one blood. Yes, we do. Yes, the blood of man. Yes, man's blood is in us. Yes. Yes, blood is blood, but uh, type O, type B. But then again, there's uh, cultural differences. There are different kindreds, okay? But yes, like it was said to me by a beautiful Hamite brother long ago, long ago, before I was even saved, and I'm sure that man is in heaven. He said to me, uh, you know, if you were to punch me in the nose, what color would my blood be? And if I were to punch you in your nose, what color would your blood be? Okay. Let's continue. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And here's the difference in culture. Because God is a God of variety. He likes different variety. Okay? Simple. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Okay? God likes different flavors. There are many horses. But there are different types of horses. There are many birds. But there are different types of birds. There are many of men. But there are different types of men. Okay? Of Shem, of Ham, 
and of Japheth. Okay? Okay? See how that works? And that's beautiful. That's, that's scripture. There ain't nothing wrong with that. That ain't being a kindredist. God loves variety. Okay? Okay? God doesn't, God is not a cookie cutter. Okay? He isn't. All right? God never changes. Okay? The way he deals with man, that's what differs. He himself never changes, but he likes variety. Okay? The cliche. When God made you, he broke the mold. That's true. Okay? That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. But a graven image is only something made out of stone. It could be a portrait, a drawing, a picture of a lion's face. Okay? And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. He winked at that ignorance. Ignorance is not knowing better. Okay? At the time, in a different dispensation. It's like, okay, these guys don't know better. You, Israel, you're supposed to be my uh, representatives so these people would know better. Okay? Today, we as a church of the living God, there are ignorant people out there. Okay? There are. But see, what does this say? What say it the scripture? And the times of this ignorance God winked at in other dispensations. But now, today, in this dispensation, to the Jew first and also to us Gentiles. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Okay? He at one time winked at that ignorance, but today, no, no, no. If you don't know better, that can be cured. If you don't want to know better, that's stupid. That's stupid. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto, unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Yes, dear friends. Yes. Assurance. And what is that? That seal until the day of redemption? The Lord within us? Okay? That is the seal. Okay? And also now... Acts 20, verses 17 on to verse 21. See, we are to be warning people. The redemption of the purchased possession draweth nigh. When we don't know, things are getting worse. It's not going to get better. And we as the church of the living God, while we are wasting our time about this ridiculous holiday coming up, that's distracting us from what? Being witnesses on to the lost. Okay? More on this in another video, okay, where we're going to talk about this. We have, I have no choice, okay, I really don't. But, see, these times coming are distractions. And people are saying, no, it's not, because we're taking what is pagan and trying to affix Christ's name to it. Coming from those who have said, you can't take what is pagan and make it Christian. Well, that which is pagan is Christian. Let's talk about the church and the living God, dear friend. But Acts chapter 20, verse 17 on to verse 21. Okay? And from Miltus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, not thinking of himself highly than he ought. But then again, he did, because Paul had a pride problem. Okay? He did. And with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, 
but have shewed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, Greeks or Gentiles, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And this, this here blows out of the water, this uh, elect and non-elect, this uh, chosen because of skin color thing. Uh, uh, for, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 on to verse 4. Not 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 on to verse 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Not elect and non-elect. Not Hamites, specifically. Or Japhethites, specifically. All men. Will all men come to Christ on his terms? No. 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 Sorry? No. But it's there for everybody. It's there for all. But not all is going to come on his terms. But this blows Catholicism and this then you're chosen because of this color of your skin, you wicked um, um, kindredist. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Okay, And also this is echoed in uh, 2 Peter, just one verse. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God shows patience towards safe people, but what, what do you say that? He's showing long-suffering to the world, okay, that others might be saved. We want the redemption of the purchased possession to happen yesterday. But who did the Lord save today who, he, who was not saved yesterday? you got to think above yourself. Right? I wanted the redemption of the purchased possession to happen an hour ago. So did you. But who did the Lord save today that wasn't of us yesterday? Got to remember that, brother. Got to remember that, brother, sister. Okay? Verse 7 in Jeremiah chapter 4. This Now this is interesting. This is very interesting. Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 7. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. This is talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? He has gone forth from his place to make thy land desolate, and thy city shall be laid waste without an inhabitant. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 6 on to verse 9. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Note the all again. Casting all. The Lord is our all. Okay? Nothing of me. The Lord is our all. Okay? Be sober. Be in your right mind. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, as a roaring lion, and when our Lord come back at the second coming with us, he's going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. As a roaring lion. Mm -hmm. Note that. <clears throat> be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Okay, hath God said? Did God really say that? It's okay. Everybody does it. it I'm sure, it was started by Catholicism, but that's okay. Your memories are fine. It's a good time. It's all about you and what justifies you. Sure. And hey, here, let's go. I can show you some places that not even your brethren can refute. Whom resist 
steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Okay? The lion. Okay? Right there. The lion has come up from his thicket. Our adversary, the devil. And isn't it interesting that we're going to see the enemies of our Lord and my personal enemies are probably because this is this uh, coming up. This is the month of the Catholic. This is Catholicism, one of their greatest months, December. It's pagan paganisms, one of their greatest months. Okay? But the lion has come up from his thicket. And our adversary as a roaring lion. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 21 and 22. Okay? They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation, a Gentile nation. Now, this ties into Romans chapter 11, okay? Because if you have had any dealings with the Jewish people, the Hebraic, real Jewish people, uh, especially those who are of the Church of the Living God, you you know what I'm talking about. You have seen that jealousy. They're jealous that we are grafted into their tree. Okay? And this is in accordance with Romans chapter 11, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. This is another argument right here in verse 11. Saved people don't fall away, okay? Israel, as a, a Jewry, is not saved. It's on the individual basis today, okay? Absolutely. But has Israel, uh, as, uh, as Israel, Jewry in itself fallen away beyond uh, reach? No. Many Jews have, yes, but... All of Israel will be saved, like it even says here in Romans chapter 11. Okay? All right? Israel in itself, because of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will never be uh, thrown away. Okay? Or else God's a liar. But see, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Okay? And it's no wonder that truly saved, born-again uh, brethren of the Church of the Living God have a really big problem with calling themselves Christians. Why? Because they rightly attribute Christian to the Crusaders with their crosses on their tunics. Okay? All right? It's no wonder that a truly saved, born-again Jew has a problem with the satanic three-person trinity. Okay? It's no wonder that a Jew has a problem with the pagan festival and attributing that to their Messiah. Okay? Jewry that is saved. Those of our brothers and sisters of the Church of the Living God who are of Israel. They, they are not jealous of this Christianity. They abhor it. Okay? They abhor it. And when those who have the word of God bicker among themselves over paganism, they don't, they're not jealous of that. They're not. They are not. And also while we're in Romans chapter 11, verses 27 on to verse 29, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins at the second coming. Okay? As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, now, contact, context here, election here, he's talking about the Jews, and we have already looked how the Lord chose Israel, okay? The, the Jew is the apple of God's eye. The Hebrew taken out of Shem, okay? That will not change, okay? Jewry in itself, because 
As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your, your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Because of the promise made unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Israel, Jewry, in itself, is not fallen away. There are many Jews who have fallen away. Because they're not of us. Okay? But Jewry will be saved. Okay? Because of the Father's sakes. Okay? For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The apple of God's eye is the Jew. And Catholics hate that. These black Hebrew Israelites hate that. So do the Brizraelites. They hate that. Why? Because salvation is of the Jew. The Hebrew. Okay? All right? But what's interesting about this verse, uh, verse 7 here, okay, the lion, the devil, okay? But then it's like, okay, and, and the destroyer of the Gentiles, and the destroyer of, destroyer of the Gentiles is on the way, okay? Talking about King, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar at one time was, you know, being, you know, he, the Lord called Nebuchadnezzar his servant, okay? Nebuchadnezzar is in heaven, okay? I remember a brother, a Jew, who I was talking with, really struggled with that. Really struggled with that. But there again, like with any truly saved, born again, converted brother or sister, this is the standard. This is what brings us into agreement, Okay, if there's a disagreement uh, and still the, when the scriptures speak, what's the problem? Flesh is. But there is a brother, there is a brother who is like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Nebuchadnezzar is in heaven. That's what the scripture says. Okay, talk about being made jealous with a foolish nation. And eventually in Daniel chapter four, you see that Nebuchadnezzar gave homage unto the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar's in heaven. Isn't that interesting, huh? Isn't that interesting? You go to John chapter 16 now, okay? John chapter 16. You know, you tell these, uh, the Hasidim, when you mention that, it's like, well, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is in heaven. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The equivalent is saying to an easy believism devil that uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, I believe, I, yes, I do. I believe Jeffrey Dahmer is in heaven. But you don't think I'm going to heaven? I'm better than Jeffrey Dahmer. Same equivalent, okay? John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Verses 1 on to verse 4. John chapter 16. Verses 1 on to verse 4. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Say, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Hmm. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. It's like, well, Brad, what... what why, why, why this? Why, why did we go to this? Okay. A foolish nation. The Jews are supposed to be made jealous so that they will come to see their God and we Gentiles who are grafted into their tree. And Christianity, even this King James Bible believing Christianity, the Jews are not jealous of that. Okay, they're not. Jews are not jealous of Christianity. They're not, okay? But see, when we as the church of the living God challenge what is Christianity, they love the traditions of men. And for their name of Christianity, they persecute us and they make us the enemy who are telling them the truth, see? See, when someone tells these Christians and these who love paganism and justify it, the truth, 
They turn and rend on us, and they think that they're doing God's service. Well, you're speaking against liberty. You don't even know what that is, pal. Okay, you don't. You make it cheap to justify paganism, pal. Okay? But liberty is what? Freedom. All things are lawful for you. And that is undisputed. That is undisputed. God's not forcing you to make the right decisions. Okay? He's not. He's not. That is undisputable. God is undisputable. You, as the church of the living God, you can go ahead, and if you want to, you can go ahead and be a pagan for a month and worship the God of Catholicism on a specific day of the year. You can do that. All things are lawful for you, but all things are not expedient. Okay? All right? They changed the narrative. We'll deal with that in another video. But what happens when you bring up the truth to these people, to these Christians, Praise the Lord, I'm not a Christian, okay? Uh, Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, where are we? Uh, oh yeah, Acts chapter 7, verse 54, okay? Acts chapter 7, verse 54, you know, Stephen laying it, down, laying it down on them. And what happens? When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. There are other places where they stopped their ears and gnashed on the Lord with their teeth. I don't want to hear it. I'm going to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, as much as I want to do it, because all things are lawful for me. You're right, all things are lawful for you. But you're not edifying the Lord. You're not. You're not. You're edifying the enemy. And when you as a church of the living God justify whatever your sin is, you're edifying the enemy. But they were cut to the heart. Where in Acts chapter 2, they were pricked in the heart. There's a difference. Okay? And also, uh, Acts chapter 22, another example of this, when truth comes to the surface and these people, it's like, I don't want to hear it! I don't want to hear it. Acts chapter 22, verses 21 under verse 22. And he said unto me, Paul, giving his defense unto his brethren when he erroneously went into the temple like he did to make James happy, you know, uh, uh, that um, about Acts chapter, what, 21. Uh, the Lord's will be done, but maybe not our way. That will be... Uh, Hold on, writing that down. Be in the description box of this one again. But he was making defense unto the people, and the people were hearing him. And he said unto me, Depart, the Lord said unto Paul, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Now the people were listening unto Paul. And they gave him audience unto this word. And then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Because he said, The Lord sent me on to the Gentiles. They were listening up to that point. They were listening to Stephen until he's like, You, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in ears and heart, ye always do resist the Holy Ghost. They gnashed on him with their teeth because they cut them to their heart. Paul here said, the Lord sent me to the Gentiles. What did they do? They lifted up their voice and said, away with such a fellow. Spoke the truth. And they'll listen to you to a point. But then when you touch that one, when you touch that little Isaac of theirs that they don't want to put on the altar, they're holding back that little thing. Then they turn and rend you. They turn and rend you, brethren. And let's go to now the now let's see a New Testament uh, uh, thing of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's an example of this, and this is happening today. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, 
and such fornication as it is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Ew. Wasn't his actual mother his father's wife, his stepmother? So a stepson was lying with his stepmother, which is clearly forbidden and called sin in Leviticus and transcend it crosses dispensational lines. Okay, that's sin. Okay. And how are the Corinthian Christians? How are the Corinthians handling it? And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. What were they doing? We're not going to judge you. This is when you need us. Okay, yeah, that, that's pretty gross, but this is when you need to come to church. That's when you need your Christian family. And look, hey, look at how righteous we are. We're not judging. We're, we're being like Christ. We're not judging like it says in Matthew chapter 7. That's what this is. That's what Christianity does. To justify sin. To justify paganism. They don't mourn. It's like, hey, we're not judging you. And they'll justify it through scripture. Yeah. Woe to you who seek to justify your sin by twisting scripture. Woe to you. Woe to you. For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already. Ah, oh, there's that thing about judging again. As though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This man who did this obviously was of the church of the living God. Okay? That the spirit, that the flesh might be destroyed. That the spirit may be saved. And see, what happens is when someone who is saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, God goes far beyond correction, rebuke, admonishment, anything, but just will not drop that sin. That is not only killing himself, but making the Lord look bad. It could get to a point where the Lord's like, okay, You've been warned, you have been rebuked, you have corrected, been corrected, but you will not, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Whatever it is, it could get to the point where the Lord will be like, fine, I hand you over to the devil, that your body may be destroyed, you know, the skin suit, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, having mercy, that you don't continue in sin. That is a real possibility, okay? Got to be aware of that. You gotta be aware of the cost of your sin. You're if you're of the church of the living God and you're in sin, you're not gonna lose your salvation because it's not yours to lose. But you can lose so many other things. Doth not our Lord's honor mean anything to you? Your glory is not good. We're not judging you. That's when you need us, you Christians. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the, the covetous which the Lord abhorreth, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. Yeah, and we're called to be ambassadors for Christ, having the word of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. But see, we are to prefer one another. Okay? Okay? But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called, is called, you are because you say you are, right? Is called a brother. Be a for, uh, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer 
or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one know not to eat. Look at idolater. Always, always just a little statue, right? No, man. Look at that. All of that is idolatry. Fornicator. Fornicator. Okay? Covetous, who the Lord abhorreth. An idolater. I, idol, idolizing themselves, their own self-righteousness. You know, got tennis elbow by patting themselves on the back. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Kick them out. Have no, nothing to do with them anymore. I've had to do that. I've had to do that myself. Some crazy people. Some crazy people who might actually be saved, but just crazy and in sin and are worshipers of men, idolaters. Idolaters. Okay? Verse 8 in Jeremiah chapter 4. For this, gird you with sackcloth, lament and howl. For the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. You be made aware of your sin, brethren, sisters, church of the living God. Okay, you're being warned of things. Okay, what ought you to do? Let's, let's start in the Old Testament here. Let's look at Joel. Joel, chapter 1. Joel, by the way, is after Hosea. Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Okay, all right. Joel, chapter 1, just one verse, verse 14. Sanctify ye your fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Let's read verse 14, uh, 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Some of you need to repent before the Lord steps in and takes action, like we just read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay. Now, can, for example, can America or your nation do this? No. It's on the individual basis. But we're to mourn. We be made aware of our sin. You know, we need to get right with the Lord. And uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 12 on to verse 14. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Don't hold a little bit back because of tradition. But give him your all. And with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And rend your heart. Not your garments. Don't do it just on the outside. Be mournful on the inside. Because so many people want to make a shoe on the outward appearance that they are repentant. But on the inside they're still full of dead men's bones. And turn... Unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil, because he delighteth in mercy. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. And we got to read this verse. We got to read this verse. Okay? We have to. Uh, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion! Sanctify a fast! Call a solemn assembly and you're to continue, but we're not. Make people aware. Warn them. Warn them. Don't be silent. Speak. If the Lord will have you to be silent, then don't. Go as the Lord will lead you. But if the Lord has led you into something to speak about, speak up. Speak up. Because too many people are afraid to speak up. Because they're afraid of reproach. You got to get over that one, brother, <laughs> sister. And go to Romans chapter 3 because you got to remember. You got to remember. Romans chapter 3. Some of the most abhorred verses to the easy believism heretic. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 on to verse 18. 
As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Do a study on all sometime on your own time. Very rewarding. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. you got to remember, brother, sister, you're saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, but see, you're still a saved sinner. And because our spirit and soul are housed within this, that battle with sin is never going to go away until we get redeemed or die. To be absent with the body, uh, to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. Okay, we've got to remember that. And also, Second Corinthians chapter seven. Second Corinthians chapter seven. Another thing that the easy believism heretics like to mess with. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 on to verse 12. For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now, now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. See, godly sorrow has two aspects. Brings people to salvation, but then again, when you are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, that sorrow, godly sorrow, worketh in you when you do something that you shouldn't. You, it loads you down with guilt and shame. Okay, it's a two-edged sword. And see, the easy believism heretics uh, likes to uh, make a big thing about worldly sorrow and godly sorrow, and they go to the Philippian jailer, and he said he had worldly sorrow. Uh, well, it says here, and we're going to see worldly. Now, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. Save people who were made aware of their sin, uh, got right with God, okay? For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. One edge of that two-edged sword. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, the second edge of that two-edged sword. So godly sorrow has two points to it at least. That godly sorrow, you're saved, it will convict you. It's like, oh, wow, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. I'm not going to do that again. Help me to not, I did it again. Oh, wretched man. Okay, godly sorrow. But godly sorrow that worketh to uh, salvation. Those who are not saved, it's like, I'm going to hell. I'm not a good person. I put him on that cross. It's a two-edged sword. Okay. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. And the Philippian jailer didn't die, did he? Okay. And see, the easy believism devil likes to take this verse and they go to the Philippian jailer. Uh, it's like, well, see, he just believed. He had godly sorrow going on to repentance. And they say, well, he had worldly sorrow. He didn't die, did he? Did he? Judas had worldly sorrow. Okay? He done hung himself. Okay? All right? Watch out for these twits who save themselves by their own belief. Okay? Verse 11. Okay? Verse 11. For behold, the selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sword. Okay, back to the other edge of the two-edged sword. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. When you sin and the Lord makes you know about it in godly sorrow, it's like, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Lord, help me. I, I don't want to do this again. I hate it. I hate it. I hate that I do it. Please, Lord. Please. But see, easy believers and heretics say, oh, don't worry. It's not going to affect your salvation. You shouldn't do it, but don't worry. God's grace covers it all. They have no fear of God before their eyes. Because the easy believism heretic despise Romans 3, 10 on to verse 18. Because they avoid it altogether. Okay? 
In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wherefore though I wrote unto you, I did there wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care uh, for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. What does that mean? Paul cared enough about someone to tell them the truth about it. You want to show hate to someone? Don't say anything. I joy for the love that I get from the saints who are willing to tell me. Uh, my brother from Croatia is really good for this too. Uh, he's like, Brad, you know, you shouldn't have done that. You're right, brother. Thank you. A sister. Brad, you, thank you. My wife. Brad, you're right, baby. Reading scripture daily. The Lord, Brad, you're right. You're right. See, if you love someone in a tactful way, you don't have to be a jerk about it. But see, most people are. True brethren, true friends are not jerks about it. Brother, brother, let's talk. Let's talk. You said this, but it is, oh, thank you. I appreciate a rebuke. Reproofs of instruction are the way of life. It shows that a brother loves you or a sister loves you enough to tell you the truth. You want to show hate to someone? Don't tell them the truth and let them go on and dive off that cliff that they're running to. That's hatred. And that is what Christianity does. They don't talk to you about the fear of the Lord. They say that God's not mad at you. Don't judge them. Don't scare them. No, scare the hell out of them. Tell them the truth. That's showing love. Showing hate is like, hey, keep running. You're going to fall off that cliff and die. But hey, God's not God. God loves you. That's hatred. That's hatred. God's love, that's east, is at Calvary. And if you don't go his way, his love is not for you. It's that simple. It's that simple. Okay? It is that simple. All right? And 2 Corinthians chapter 2 now. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And here is where a lot of these people fall short. You know, the Lord says to us, if your brother come to you and repent to you seven times a day, forgive him. Okay? That doesn't mean that fellowship will be there, but what does this mean? Forgive. Okay? Now, remember, when our Lord said that, he was uh, offering the kingdom of heaven. And in the kingdom of heaven, it's all works. In the kingdom of heaven, if you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. But that's works. Okay? Today, your forgiveness is not based upon you forgiving someone. Okay? That's not how it works today in this dispensation. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? But, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and verse 11. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. He's talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That's what he's referring to. Okay? Paul loved them enough to tell them the truth. Okay? That's what he's talking about. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. You know, one guy, one hot shot opens his mouth, and then it just starts this whole cavalcade, the court of public opinion. Okay? Manipulating people in order to sell something eventually, okay? But it starts, and see, that's shrewd. It starts the knowing that they can manip manipulate the people to be on their side, okay? Okay? All right? That's what that's talking about. But, okay, enough people have done wrong, to, uh, have inflicted this, okay? This guy obviously repented, okay? Let's keep reading. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him. 
There are some people out there who just keep laying charge upon charge upon charge. When you yourself, right brother or sister, you got right with the Lord, you got into the scripture, you were rebuked, you were corrected, you were chastened, and it's like, Lord, forgive me, and the Lord forgave you. But what happens? Man might not forgive you. Right? The Lord will forgive you, but man might not. So that ye contrarywise, so that contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. And see, that's what some of these Christians will do when you chafe them, when they get chafed and they want to cause division and keep paganism and stuff like that. They know that they can get the people on their side and try to bog people down when you yourself might have been in error or in sin or whatever it is, and you got right with the Lord, but yet they want to keep it going. They want to hold a grudge. See? Now, fellowship-wise, if there were certain people who came to me, it's like, Brad, you and I have had our problems. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I've done that to, some, uh, to a guy um, who I had a problem with, and I went to him and I repented. We're not going to have fellowship but I'm forgiven, okay? That's the way it works. See, once fellowship gets broken, most of the time it's not going to be repaired. But see, forgiveness is there, okay? And forgiving others is not a requirement for salvation. That's how it will be in the kingdom of heaven. But see, if you don't forgive someone, especially a brother whom you've had a problem with, it's not going to cost you your salvation, but that root of bitterness is going to spring up it's going to cause bitterness. It's going to harm your walk with the Lord, your relationship. It's like, okay, you hurt me once, shame on you. You hurt me twice, shame on me. I forgive you what for what you've done, but we're not going to have fellowship anymore. I can't. can't trust you. I forgive you, okay? But I'm not going to let you back in so you can bite my hand again, okay? I forgive you. I let it go. I go on, okay? By God, you go that way. I go this way. We're done, okay? No more problems. Okay, fellowship ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Okay? Okay? There are too many people over the traditions of man and because of pride want to hold on to a grudge. Okay? You might say, well, Brad, you do that. Yeah, I struggle with that. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And you know what happens? It affects my walk and it affects my testimony. It does. Why? Because bitterness. Uh, I, I, I struggle with bitterness. Okay, I do. I do. I struggle with bitterness myself. Okay? I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But see, for your own health, your own spiritual health, for your relationship with the Lord, sometimes, brethren, you got to let it loose. Okay? Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. And the Catholics come to this to justify their Jesuit priesthood. No, 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 no. What is he talking about? Well, I'll show you what he's talking about. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. What does this mean? You hold on to bitterness... You don't want to forgive and let it go. Satan will come in with one of his devices. That's where my enemies come in really good. You know, they, they do. They do, you know, and that's a tactic of the enemy to keep you bogged down in the past, to weigh you down. Like the Jesuits, they never forgive nor forsake. Okay? And unless we forgive, it's not going to cause a call, uh, you know, cost us our salvation. But peace. It'll cost us our peace, our walk, our testimony, our fruit, our relationship. Holding on to a grudge and not forgetting and letting go is so costly to us. Even though you might be just, you need to let some things go, brother, sister. You need to, you need to let some things go. And that's what these videos are about, letting go. Because like a bear chafed, they're going to want to get even. And it's up to them to get even. 
Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But what is he talking about here in verse 10? Okay. What is he talking about? Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. See, the Catholic uh, priest will come around and use that to justify confession where the Jesuits get all their information to rule the world. Okay. But um, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 on to verse 32. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption, once saved, always saved. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgave you, hath forgiven you. That's what Paul means when in the person of Christ. Not meaning that he takes the person of Christ to forgive, to absolve people like the Catholic priest. No. This is what he's talking about, okay? And also in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 on to verse 13. Verses 12 on to verse 13. Not as though I had already attained, neither, not Philippians, Brad, uh, Colossians 3, sorry, Colossians 3, 12 on to verse 13. Colossians 3, 12 and 13. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, we've already covered this, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. In context, both times, for the church of the living God, forgiving one another. And also helpful for yourself, not needful for salvation, but helpful for yourself, forgive people who have wronged you. Okay, Even those who are too proud and arrogant to say, well, I've done nothing wrong. Forgive them. Your relationship and walk will be better that way, trust me. Verse 9 in Jeremiah chapter 4. And it shall come to pass at that day, sat the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish and the heart of the prince's and the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. Because people are warning of the truth, and these kings and priests and prophets will come along itching people's ears, and the kings want to hold on to their sin. They want to hold on to their unrighteousness. Their hearts will melt when the truth comes to light. Isaiah chapter 22 and, these is, and this is for people who hear the truth. They see our witness and testimony. They hear what we have to say. But they, I'm going to do what I... What are they doing? Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22, verses 8 on to verse 4. 8 on to verse... Uh, 8 on to verse 14. Isaiah 22. 8 on to verse 14. And he... And he discovering, discovered the covering of Judah. And now did us look in the day, in that day, to the armor of the house of the forest, discovering the covering of Judah, made known to them their sin. And what did they do? They looked to the things of the, the world, to the forest, right? To the armor of the house of the forest. So the Lord makes known to them their sin, but they look to worldly things to correct it or to cover it, right? Ye have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that they are many. And ye gathered together the waters of the lower pool. The people gathered together. Okay? And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem. And the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall. Broken down the houses to justify the wall. To justify your sin. To build up your wall and your conceit. He made also a ditch between the two walls for the water of the old pool. But have, but ye have not looked unto the maker thereof, neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. No, you look to the, the people, to the waters, to the forest, to the covering of the world, and then you make a big trench. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And in that day, and in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. Repent. And behold, 
joy and gladness, slaying oxen, killing sheep, eating flesh, and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. My best life now. I'm going to live it up. <laughs> I'm going to live it up. Yeah. I, all things are lawful for me. I have the liberty to do this. You sure do, buddy. Bravo. Bravo. And see, when you run into people like that who will not take correction, brethren, verse 14, and it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord God of hosts. And unfortunately, that is the case for so many of the church of the living God who have these little pet sins that they will not get rid of. This is, it's going to be there till you die. Whatever it is, Whatever it is. And that's sad. And that's the truth of the matter. They're going to build up their high wall and their conceit. No matter what the truth you can show them. And it, it doesn't matter. Because they're going to justify it. Okay. Okay. And you also got to remember in Jeremiah uh, chapter 7 verse 16. You know, well, some of you might be saying, well, well wait a minute, Brad. Wait a minute, Brad. What about, you know, look at verses 14 on to verse 18 here in Jeremiah chapter 4. Okay? Okay? O Jerusalem, wash thine heart from thy wickedness, that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? For a voice declareth from Dan, and pub publisheth affliction from Mount Ephraim. Make ye mention to the nations. Behold, publish against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country, spies, okay, and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. As keepers of a field are they against her round about, because she hath been rebellious against me, saith the Lord. And verse 18, thy way and thy doings have procured these things unto thee. This, thy way, this is thy wickedness, because it is bitter. Because it reacheth unto thine heart. See, these people, a lot of people have set up their idols in their heart. Which is not just a statue. It's their ide ideology, their tradition, or whatever it is. They set it up in their heart. And they won't admit that it's wrong. They won't even admit that it comes from paganism. Okay? Or your sin. It's like, I know. And, you, and some don't even justify it. Praise the Lord. But it's like, dude, you know. It was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts. Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till ye die, saith the Lord God of hosts. And you know, with some of these people, with some of this stuff, it's like casting your pearls before swine. You know. Don't even mention it to them. Because they've made their choice. That's sad. That's sad. And also in Jeremiah chapter 14, look at verse 22. And this is our Lord talking about the people in the in another dispensation to those who he, who he was married unto. For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sotus children. They're going to do what they want to do the way they want to do it. I want, I want, I want, I want. Me, 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 me. I, 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 I. Okay. And they have none understanding departing from evil. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge on what is good. What is good? And Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3. Okay? Not Zechariah. Zephaniah. Zephaniah, which is before um, Haggai and is after Habakkuk. Zephaniah chapter 3. Verses 1 on to verse 5. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. 
He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. He faileth not. But the unjust knoweth no shame. And see, what happens is when people will start to justify their sins rather than truth. A good example of this is John chapter 11. John chapter 11. There is hope for you of the church of the living God. If you're in sin, if you have fallen, okay, you can return to the Lord. Okay, you read 1 John chapter 1, which we're not going to read to today because we're running out of time here. But, um, you know, there isn't a sin that the Lord cannot and will not forgive. The unpardonable sin will be in the description box, okay? Okay, that's not for us today, okay? But see, it can get to a point where hearts will be so hardened and idols will be so prominent in men's hearts that in John chapter 11, verse 50, 47 on to verse 54, look at this. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. So their existence, their life, and you read uh, Matthew chapter 23 about the Pharisees, okay? They love the praises of men. So, did they really care? Were they really so concerned about their nation? Well, they were Jews, yes, but they were concerned more so about losing their posh little things, their traditions that they exalted above Scripture. They were worried more about losing what made them feel good and made them feel important. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, neither consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this he spake, and this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. And that's true. Okay, that's true. Yes, it's true. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Okay? Then, now look at this. Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Making him the scapegoat. And he prophesied rightly that yes, on him laid the sin of all. Yes, as it says in Isaiah 53. But see, they're, what they were about, they were about protecting their posh little lifestyle, their traditions, what they wanted to do. That was more important to them than truth because then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence onto a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim. And there continued with his disciples. And see, it got so bad in Israel that their traditions, that they exalted more than scripture, that what they wanted to be called rabbi, rabbi, that all their works they did for to see, be seen of men. They loved the praises of men more than the praises of God. Okay? They loved flesh more than God. It got so bad that it even went to these lengths in John chapter 19, verses 15 on to verse 23. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now think about that. The Jewish people hate Rome. Not all of them, because unfortunately today there are some stupid Jews who have sold out to the Vatican, and it's going to be the Vatican during the time of Jacob's trouble that's going to financially back Israel. Okay? That's what, you know, come in peaceably. You know, that man of sin, the son of perdition, he's going to be a Hebraic Jew. Okay? Satan is going to have to become what he hates the most, the Hebraic people, the Jew. Okay? 
because salvation is of the Jew. Okay, we've talked about that at length. Okay, but most of the Jews hate, especially here, they hated Rome. Praise the Lord. But see, they were willing to say that Caesar was their king. Then accept the son of David, their rightful, their true king. And people are willing to side with what they know is evil rather than to forsake what they feel good, their traditions from men. They were willing to take Barabbas over Jesus. Barabbas was a murderer. They called for a Barabbas, okay? Over Jesus, who never sinned, okay? Those are the lengths that people will go to to defend themselves, to defend their sin, to de justify whatever it is that they want to justify. And the Jews, we have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. And the chief priests of the Jews of the... And the, then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but he, that he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Then the, the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Okay, well, we didn't read, didn't read verse 23. But, see, they were so afraid. They did not want to give up their posh little thing, their traditions of men. They didn't want to give up their posh little existence when truth came and spoke to them face to face. They were rather willing to side with the enemy than to accept truth. They were willing to take a murderer than truth. They were willing to say, we have no king but Caesar than to accept truth. And you know what, brethren? When someone gets to that point in their life, that iniquity will not be purged from them till they die. But see, there is hope for you. Brethren, sisters, church of the living God. You got a sin problem, which we all do. You can repent. You can get right with the Lord. You can get right with the Lord. And we need to be diligent, vigilant, vigilant, excuse me, and um, continue to preach the gospel and to warn the lost people, especially in this time of the year, because you're going to see distraction. You are going to be purposely distracted by people who want to make a name for themselves and want to ingratiate themselves among the people. You got to watch out for that. You gotta watch out for that, okay? That's why this these videos are coming before December, because once December comes, done with it, done with it. Let them do their little thing. Let them change the narrative and not deal with the facts, okay? We, secure to the living God. Let us press forward. Let us press toward the high calling of being in Christ Jesus. There's hope for you, brother, sister. There's hope for you. Okay? E even if you've gotten away from the Lord, there is hope. There is hope. There is hope. So, that's going to be it for this video. I've got some emails to answer. A few, uh, one email in particular, a little confused about, but um, that's going to be it for this video. Uh, 
thank you so much for watching this if you do. And thank you. Thank you so much to you brethren, you sisters, our beloved brothers and sisters that pray for us and help us and are there for us. Um, thank you. We love you all so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching this if you do. We love you. Lord willing, we will see you in the next video.